and welcome to exam two review. I'm always glad to have you. Remember, anytime you're not understanding, do not feel afraid to ask me. I will answer your questions because if you don't understand, there's no reason for me to continue. So if you uh, need extra help, different explanation, different words, please just let me know. Um, this is four, five, six. You've already gotten, hopefully, the copies of all the cahoots. If you have not gotten those copies, send a message to me and I'll make sure that you do get them, okay? I have access to all classes. All right, cognitive and sensory impairment. So we're going to do sense. A sense is the eyes. You're seeing, right? So there is amblopia, strabismus, and nystigmus. Now, amblopia is what we call the lazy eye. That one eye just doesn't work correctly, right? And what happens with that eye? You'll see it flailing from side to side, and you're going to see it not really straight with the other one. And you're like, well, what's happening here? Um, and you don't want your little girl, your little boy, be cross-eyed. So how do you fix this? Well, you take a patch and you put it over the good eye. And why do you put it on a good eye? Because you want that bad eye, that muscle, which is not strong. That's why it's going to the sides up or down. Um, it'll make it work and it will strengthen it. Strabismus is another one where, think about a, a newborn. They're born with binocularity, it's called, where you have two eyes, they're not working together. I mean, me or you, put your finger out, our eyes will go to it, right? And that also is depth perception. In strabismus, this eye works here and this eye works there. Even going cross midpoint, you cannot focus, okay? And that is called strabismus. Again, um, this will be a lot of eye exercises. And, you know, the, the last thing that we would think about that would might be the um, surgery. And then the third one that was mentioned that I don't have a slide on is nystigmus which is a little flickering, the eyes just flick, you know, not necessarily together or they could be different. And that's the nystigmus. Okay, early cognitive impairment. How are we gonna know if there's uh, impairment? Um, and why do we wanna know that? Well, we wanna know these things just in case we need to, you know, do early intervention, right? That's the big thing where we can give speech, physical, occupational therapy and catch these kids up. So what do we look for? Well, they might look different. I mean, think of a Downs child, right? Almond eyes, the tongue sticking out, you know, the flat nose. Those are things that will say, oh, okay, that kid looks different. Some of these kids are irritable for no reason. And why are they irritable? They're not paying attention. They're not understanding. So I'm going to be upset and I'm going to be irritable if I can't express myself or I don't understand you, right? One of the other things is, there's no response to that physical environment. You can call these kids over and over and over again. And these kids usually don't respond to you. You have to get right up in front of them, um, especially when you get to the point of um, autism. Another thing is you're going to see the delays. Uh, you know, in the first year, there's a lot of things that happen. So that pincer grasp, it doesn't happen. Putting blocks together in and out by um, 12 months, it's going to be delayed. Your gross, your fine motor. Gross motor, they may not be walking and they may not walk or they may not be able to sit till a year old. Those are things we're going to be looking for. Uh, talking, they may not talk the way that they should. You should do at least one word by one year and everybody, is it mama or is it dada, right? Well, I was grateful my grandson was Nana. So I was a lucky Nana. Um, behavior difficulties. Again, that's the irritability. I don't know what you're under telling me to do. I'm not understanding and I can't speak so I can't express myself, even in two and three-year-olds, okay? And none of the milestones are being met. So something's going on here. Now, I mentioned Down syndrome. We know that there's a short, stubby fingers. You're going to see the creamy increase, the seam increase here, right across. One thing I look at when I always suspect a newborn, you're going to see that palate and side arch. The tongue is one of those things you always see. The almond eyes. And these children are prone for cardiac defects. 
Uh, VSD, number one is the biggest. You might see Truncus, AV Canal. Those are two other ones. And they're just the way the heart just open and flows. You don't go into those in detail in the cardiac, but um, just to know cardiac problems. They're hypotonic. They can move their both feet up over their heads. Got to be careful for a hip displacement on that. And then you've got that wide space between the toes. One of the things we have to be concerned about is upper respiratory infections in these children. This nose is flat and it causes it mucus to sit there. So that underdeveloped nasal bone creates mucus there, dripping, which creates buildup. It's like a Petri dish, bacteria, the kids are getting sick. So Down syndrome, cardiac, and um, a lot of upper respiratories. Now children cognitive delays, Down syndrome, really need special attention if we need to admit them into a hospital. Um, they really have high anxiety. Very important parents stay with them. The number one thing that will de decrease stress in children in hospitalization is parents staying with them. And then after that, we have maybe some things that are familiar, whether uh, and following the same routine, um, same foods if at all possible, having their special blanket or their special pacifier, depending on um, the age of the child. So early interventions, you know, we've talked about this before, things that we should be doing. So if by two months, they're not making any single vowel sounds, by three to four, they're not cooing, gurgling and laughing, imitating sounds, guess what? Something's happening. Are they hearing correctly? Get a hearing evaluation. They should be speaking three to five different words by one year. Um, so these are things that we need to look at. What would we do? Number one, why? Evaluate the hearing. And then, of course, get speech therapy involved because they can catch these kids up really, really quick. So infants may be exposed to all of these things and those who do not respond and are not meeting those um, vials, um, uh, milestones on um, verbal talking, remember mouth and ears are connected. If you can't hear, you don't speak. And if you can't speak, you probably can't hear. Same thing, right? Autism, what are we gonna see? Well, usually we don't diagnose them till about two years old. Um, these children don't like to look at you. Um, they don't like to be looked at. They're, again, they don't respond to their names. They're in their own little world and their own little place. They're not gonna be imitating what you do. And they do these unusual repetitive behaviors. I use this one boy um, that was in the daycare, this PPAC that I had taught clinicals with. He was actually a Downs autistic child. And he would take a truck and he would take and maybe put a doll on top and then put a blanket on top and he'd take it and he would put it on top of a chair. He would take it off the chair, take the blanket off top, take the doll off and then take the fire truck and put it back down. And he would do it over and over and over again. Very unusual thing, not usual playing that you see. I mean, kids do it once and they keep going. An autistic kid, rep repetitive, repetitive. Again, fine, gross motor skills completely delayed. They're not gonna speak as much as they should and they're not gonna walk as when they should. Um, so there's gonna be delays there. They wanna be alone. They also, foods, textures, some of them, you can't give it to them. It creates them to start squelching. They don't like that, whatever, maybe it is too hard, maybe too soft. Um, all different textures they don't like. And they don't like noise. Um, these children uh, like to be in a quiet, not br brightly lit room. Now, immunizations. Immunizations in children we know are really important. And there are times where they cannot get them. Well, any kid or adult who is receiving steroids is deemed immunosuppressed. So guess what? no vaccines during that time. Um, also, you have children, young, as we had gone over um, this week, some kids um, that get like leukemia, they're two to three years old, is, is a common age. So they're still getting immunizations. So these children, 
um, cannot receive live vaccines during the chemo. Now, the families, the brothers, sisters can, but they cannot get it for that child who um, is immunosuppressed for whatever the reason, steroids, whether immunosuppressive disease or cancer. Now, there are times where uh, parents do not want vaccines. And you will see either religious, personal beliefs, they've read something, there's all sorts of these false things that are out there that have hopefully been squashed, but you know, um, the research things are still there. Uh, safety concerns, and sometimes parents just wanna know everything about what they're gonna give to their kids. So that's not a bad thing to have. Now, first thing in the hospital after birth, Usually, before they go home, they get their hepatitis B. That's your first immunization. Um, and if not, they'll get it the first visit. Usually, it has to do with insurance or something like that. It uh, has nothing to do usually with a child. Actually, kids who are exposed to hepatitis get it even earlier, as quick as possible, maybe like six, within six hours. Now, kids do end up in the hospital can be acutely ill and could be uh, in bed uh, for long periods of time. And just like adults, we still have to worry about skin care, right? Worried about their lungs, worried about blood clots, um, decubitus ulcers, um, foot drops, all of these things children can get just like adults. Might take a little bit longer, but they still can happen. So how do we prevent it or decrease the incidence? Well, number one, good nutrition. Absolutely, if you don't have nutrition, the protein, which can heal you, the fat that they need and the carbohydrates for energy, they're not going to have good skin. You need to put them on a draw sheet so you don't just pull them up and just go right across the uh, sheet, which could rip skin off of them. So pick them up, pull them over and put them down. Good skin moisturizer. Use in either diapers or a pad, keeping them dry. Always turning them every two hours, use blankets. I use toys. I use those little beanie babies were great ones for ET tubes I've used for years. Um, pillows, blankets, whatever, and get them on their side. And um, always use, uh, if you have uh, one of those um, a crate mattresses or one of those beds that work for bigger kids, absolutely use them. And remember, just because they're a kid doesn't mean they're not gonna get a decubitus, they will. Now, taking care of a kid and assessing them can be quite a, a struggle, especially when you're talking toddlers and early preschoolers. They just want mommy, daddy. They do not like strangers, most of them. And now you've got to do an assessment. Now, how are you going to do it? Well, we're going to let mommy hold the child. We're going to get down below them, right? We don't want to be above them staring at them. We want to be below and we're gonna let them touch and feel the equipment, whatever we need to do. And we're gonna make it fun, you know, for starting, you know, where's your ears, where's your nose, that play. And then here, listen to my chest, I'm gonna to listen to yours. And it will allow you to do an assessment um, and get it more accurate. Now, children are always playing. Now in the hospital, we use play for different things also. Uh, we could do it so that they can get out frustrations, that's expressive, expressive plays or activities. Um, dramatic play is where something that fearful has happened in, in the past or the recent hospitalization, and they can express their fear through dramatic play. And it can help the healthcare provider understand it, especially if they have to go through that again. So dramatic play is for the hospital and it works well. And then, of course, creative play is another way to express feelings um, with them. Um, it could be uh, telling them, you know, how they're in pain, where they're in pain. Now, when you have a child in pain, um, make sure that we medicate them as ordered. Um, don't try to delay medications, all right? Now, some kids in pain, you need to get them up, moving them, cough, deep, breathe. Remember, a kid who's just had surgery, you need to medicate them first. Give them something for pain. Give them that uh, 
uh, moment for that pain medicine to work, then try repositioning them, elevating the head of the bed, turning them right, left, try cold packs, hot packs, whatever is appropriate for that child. And always distraction. Uh, I use things like stickers, um, music. I'd go in rooms and start dancing and have the kids put their hands up and dance with me. And yes, they thought I was a little crazy, the parents, but it's okay. The kids understood. So it didn't matter. So distraction with pain medicine, medicating them on time is how you treat that pain. Tylenol is only the pain medicine orally, that one that we can have at home for uh, infants under six months. Now, yes, they can have opioids and things like that, but at home, treating fever, treating pain, for six months, only the acetaminophen Tylenol. At six months, you can add both. Never ever add aspirin. Aspirin is only for um, certain diagnoses uh, because of the uh, coagulopathy that it's there to thin blood for, to prevention of clots like in Kawasaki disease. But besides that, we never ever recommend aspirin be given because they raise disease. Now, an IV, we need to assess it quite frequently. Remember, if it's swelling, something's going on, the first thing we're going to do, turn it off and then go and further assess. 10 mLs of fluid is nothing for me or you, but on a tiny infant, it can puff up a whole arm. So stop it, elevate it. You can apply a hospital-approved hot pack on them and tell the doctor and restart it if we need. Gastrostomy tubes are used for the child for whatever reason, can't eat the way that they should. And how do we clean it? Well, soap and water once a day. I usually would do this at the beginning of the shift, get it done, and no twisting and turning those things, no hydrogen peroxide, only soap and water is all we need. And that little um, gauze underneath there can pr um, protect the skin from irritants if we need to. Oxygen, common, especially on your newborns with tachypnea of the newborn, called TTN, transit tachypnea of newborn. And how are we going to give it where it's easily tolerated and it's accurate? Well, that good old oxy hood, it's very accurate, believe it or not. It's as accurate as nasal cannula and maybe even better. They're in that little bubble. They can look around. They can suck their fingers. There's a little sensor in there. It's going to tell how much it is. So the other ones can be used when they're needed. But remember nasal cannula, they stick their finger and they rip it off. And now usually there's tape, the skin goes. Just to show you how much percentage of oxygen, and I might use a quarter liter sometimes on nasal cannulas for children when they're at the end of just needing a little bit, you need to get them up, get them out and feed them. The cannula is more portable than the oxyhood. Um, one liter is, uh, 24%. Now we would never go to 10 liters unless we were in a mask, but it can go up to 60%. Now, catheterizing infants. Number one, why do we catheterize infants? Well, you can't put a bag on an infant and get a urine without having skin contaminants. Infants do not have an immune system. We want an accurate urine specimen to accurately treat what the germ is that is causing the infection. So it is a sterile procedure. So we can use lidocaine jelly um, instead of regular jelly, put it on first. And again, always have the parent, I always have the parents hold their hands, give them the pacifier, because that pacifier can relieve pain and it's a distraction. Um, also, make sure that we explain to the mother that we're not touching her virginity because um, parents think that. And fathers, if they're getting their little sons catheterized, just tell them to look the other direction and tell them it's just for a second. It really doesn't hurt. Now, infant labs, most of them, except for blood coagulopathies, are done by heel stick. Make sure you warm up that area. Only, again, with a hospital-approved heel warmer. You can't take a warm cloth, put it in a microwave, heat it up, and use it because you don't have a heel warmer. Go get one from somewhere else. Don't do it. You can burn these infants really, really quickly. And you hit them on the side 
and only use that infant style lancet, okay? You don't want it too deep because you can go right down to the bone. Intake and output, we know it's so important. We need to measure what goes in, what goes out to make sure they're not fluid overload. So intakes, anything by mouth and IV and anything output is anything that comes out and we can actually even measure sweat if we need to. I've never had to before, but you could put a diaper underneath big enough, you know, maybe adult size diaper underneath an infant to see how much sweat's in it. Again, weigh it before, weigh it after. And when you subtract it, it's one gram is one ml. Now, one of the things is putting medicine in a kid. You know, how do you do it? You know, I like the infants taking a little syringe and put it on the side of the mouth. Now, many kids that are two years old, you know, 18 months, they want to spit it. They don't want it. You know, they're refusing it. So you could pinch them and you can hold them. The best thing is take a deep breath and real quick, this little small puff of air. And the kid goes oh, and gets like scared for a second. And guess what? He'll swallow that medicine really easily. So stressed in a hospitalized child. Well, we mentioned about cognitive delayed. Well, um, these children, young children, also have these same fears. Number one, separation anxiety is the worst. We know at first the kid's going to be screaming and yelling and going bonkers, you know, um, and then they get to the point where they regress. And then they're like, I don't care if mom or dad are here because, you know, I've dealt with this by myself now. So it's those um, three levels of separation anxiety. Make sure, if possible, if a parent can stay with them, it is better for them. Um, it is the biggest stress is that separation. Now, that regression that occurs um, is that second stage, right, of separation anxiety here, right? So all of a sudden, as I said, there are, uh, wanting a bottle um, where they've had a cup. They want a pacifier where they haven't had one or they're incontinent. These things are telling you the child's going through some sort of stress because of hospitalization. And these children do need more attention from the nursing staff. Again, trying to get the same nurses going in, um, trying to know what are their favorite toys um, their favorite this or that so that we can um, sue them a lot better. So children can um, do their own self-soothing behaviors. But remember, again, it's those children separated from parents that are going to have the most stress. So allowing them, um, especially if mommy and daddy aren't there, getting on their level, explaining on their developmental level, and to let them touch and play with those equipment is important. Let them take a blood pressure on you first. All of those things will help because you know, mom and dad ain't there. Now, hospitalized children and younger children also, all of them like the same routines. Keep them on the same routine. When do they take their bath? When do they get dressed in the morning? Um, maybe you'll get them up and brush their teeth and change them into a new set of jammies and in the morning or uh, put on something that's appropriate for whatever their condition is there. Um, if they need to be there long, they're doing schoolwork, try to keep on the same schedules, sleep at the same time, bathe at the same time, eat at the same time, nap at the same time. That is a lot of comfort for these children. Now, when we have a child, you know, it's all about safety and taking care of them. Again, um, parents, need to be uh, watched also. Uh, just because parents are there doesn't mean a nurse doesn't go in and check what's going on. You know, making sure side rails are up, you know, especially that kid who's gonna have, might have seizures. You know, you wanna make sure they're up just in case. And um, again, always encourage if a parent can stay there, especially at night. Now, otitis media is a backup of mucus that goes up into the eustachian tubes that goes into the ears. It's the middle of the ear. It is painful. Um, I don't know if you all know, but two weeks ago, I had a tube put in my right ear for really bad otitis media. 
um, and fluid had built up in there. I had sinusitis, upper respiratory, you know, tightus media, all at the same time. So I can tell you from just recent personal experience, it hurts. Your first priority here is get that kid something for pain. Um, and then you could go and look, look inside that ear and do what you have to do a lot easier. Kids are night and day when they're not in pain anymore. Again, pain should be treated um, along with antibiotics. Drops if it's needed for a media, for an externa or um, maybe a media, which has got a lot of swelling in there, um, oral antibiotics. And then it might end up that they need tubes placed in there for that drainage like I did. And I had it done in, in the doctor's office. And I know why children are knocked out because you can hear them cut and suck the fluid out. Um, I'm not saying it hurt, but then I got up and I was dizzy. And thank God I had somebody, my husband, to drive me home. Now, bronchitis, this is the most annoying of the upper respiratories. It's dry, nothing's coming up, and it gets really bad at night. So you're exhausted from your day. You, you know, go home, you know, you're drinking the fluids, doing what you need. It's usually a virus, um, but at night you start barking. So bronchitis, non-productive, dry hacking cough, worse at night. How do we treat it? Well, giving them some sort of cough medicine that can help it be depressed if they can sleep. Croup. Croup is that very distinctive barking seal-like cough. You can hear this across the room. Um, you can hear it across the ER, if it, even if it's busy. It is inspiratory strider, okay? And it barks and barks and barks. And uh, you might have a fever, but very low grade. Um, it's the cough that brings them in. And this is usually treated with just a dose or several doses of steroids because it is viral. Now, asthma. Now, you heard me say croup is inspiratory because all the oral pharyngeal airway going in is swollen. Now, asthma, it's lower. It's in the lung. It's the bronchioles that swell up. So you get air in. But getting it out is a prolonged expiratory phase. You'll hear that and that wheezing that you might see there. Remember, asthma, we treat it with those rescues. Um, and we also use them with preventative twice a day. Um, in children, it's called uh, Pomacor. And that will help it decrease the sensitivity of the lungs and help them breathe um, easier. And also they're on that singular right now and it does work. So as I said, asthma, expiratory wheezing, no fever. And again, it's non-productive. So we've got bronchitis, dry, hacking, cough, worse at night. We've got croup with inspiratory strider with a seal-like cough. And then we have asthma, um, that expiratory wheezing where again, it's non-productive. They're similar, but they're very different. Cystic fibrosis, you're born with it. It's a one in four chance <laughs> if both parents have the, um, the trait. And many times um, we find it out because the child doesn't stool at birth, called a meconium ileus. And that is one of the earliest signs. As we go on into diagnosis, you'll, you'll hear um, me talk about it. But meconian ileus, they're not stooling, and they will be checking for cystic fibrosis. So how do they check for it? Well, the name of the test is sweat chloride test. Now, what are some things that we know about cystic fibrosis? Well, it affects the respiratory system, clogs it up with mucus, and then the pancreas gets clogged up and it doesn't work well. So you are not having fat at all being absorbed here. So if you have all this extra fat in your intestines going through, you're going to have these large, bulky, foul, I'm talking really bad, foul smelling stools. You're going to have the deficiency in all those fat vitamins because they don't absorb it. They're gone. 
And because you're not getting fat, which is your high caloric per gram, I mean, I believe it's fat and um, protein and carbohydrates are four calories per gram. I want to remember from nursing school and nine for fat. So they're losing uh, calories. So they lose weight because of all of the mucus in their lungs. You see wheezing, dyspnea, and there's going to be a non-productive cough um, with the mucus. Our goal is to get that up. Now, those lungs are like Petri dishes, so they're growing germs all the time. Now, we do that sweat chloride test because they lose salt, sodium, out of their body. They always, if you lick the kid's skin, you would taste salt. And I'm not telling you to do it, but you would. So never, ever decrease the salt in this kid's diet. In fact, give them the salt all they want, to tell you the truth. They will be getting some um, supplements of the fat vitamins, A, D, E, and K, and will be giving stuff for really intensive chest physiotherapy. We'll be doing percussion, postural drainage, positive expiratory pressures, and all of this, and we'll be doing this after we give one of those aerosols, which uh, like your albuterol, which will open up the lungs, do all this chest physiotherapy, and get it out and want to do that before they eat. Now, another thing before they eat, they're going to be taking a pancreatic enzyme immediately before they eat. It says 30 minutes, but it's right before meals and snacks. And it will help to digest that food. There are some things we need to know about that capsule or an enteric coated beads. Never ever crush or chew them. Those little capsules can be opened and you could put it on a little bit of applesauce just a spoonful, not in a whole big meal, but on a little piece so you know they swallowed it all. There is some powdered form. Make sure, um, just like some of those long-term aerosols that we use for um, the lungs, make sure they rinse their mouth. Same thing, yeast infections. Um, we wanna make sure that we uh, don't have any damage there. And the one thing in pediatrics, in all types of medicine, and we tend to forget sometimes, is make sure as they get older, bigger, gain weight, that we increase the dose as they get older. <clears throat> now, because of all this extra mucus, which lines the um, productive systems of males and females, you, uh, especially males, um, they cannot uh, make a baby because of cystic fibrosis. And of course, many men want to get married and have children. So they can, but they have to do a double lung transplant. And one year after the transplant, because it decreases the mucus isn't there, right? And the lungs and decreased um, into the vas deferens and um, the sperm production, they'll be able to produce offspring. So that's an interesting fact. Now, tonsillectomy, common in young kids with those, especially their snoring, right? Tonsils and adenoids. Postoperatively, how do we teach them? Always avoid those irritating high season foods, like no orange juice, please. Nothing red should be given because we have to look for blood. They should be resting because they've cut these things from the back and cauterized it on their scabs on either side of their throat and they can get loose and these kids can hemorrhage. And I've seen it before. Make sure they're drinking fluids because you know you need to maintain your fluid balance. Again, cool fluids are the best. Start with ice chips, popsicles, but again, nothing red. Older kids understand putting the ice on their neck. Younger kids just don't like it because it's too cold, but older kids can understand. Also older kids, because of where your eustachian tubes are, it creates pain up into the ears. If you chew gum, it helps equalize it. So chewing gum on older children, those kids who can chew it. When you have a kid with tons, post uh, tonsillectomy, if they start to swallow, they're probably bleeding and they can bleed a lot. So be aware of that. 
Now, kids get upper respiratory. Sometimes we use those little nasal sprays. Again, be careful, not more than three days. Or that stuffy nose that the mouth is open breathing at night, it's going to be worse when they're done. So no more than three days. I did asthma already. Um, this is some of the treatment I was talking about. Again, albuterol is your rescue. And then those corticosteroids, Pulmacort, as I said, morning and night. Um, again, I'd be rinsing my mouth, just whether it's Simbacort, Rio, Advair on the adult, same concept. And that singular is at night. Children, uh, especially, monitoring that peak flow meter, we can see if a kid's getting sick by how much air they're blowing. And it would be done every morning after they're well, get a measurement and get a good one. Once you have that, doing it every day. If it starts to decrease, guess what? Start the albuterol treatments because that will get those lungs open. I already did croup. We know uh, it's an inspiratory. Um, again, it's a swelling in the airway. Uh, keeping hydration is for anything that your, your children are sick. And we're going to be given steroids, as I said. Epinephrine is for those really severe cases. Now, Croup can turn into epiglottitis. Because remember, croup is inspiratory. Inspiratory is right where your epiglottis is. And the epiglottis gets swollen, covers the larynx, and you can't breathe. What do you see with epiglottitis? Well, you cannot pull air in. It's all covered. So this child is air hungry. They can't swallow. They'll be leaning forward and drooling. They'll have a garble roar, 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 type of voice. And you're going to see them get to the point where they can't breathe. This take seriously. This child may need to be intubated or need to have a tracheostomy performed. Always have that equipment at the bedside. This is a child I would bring to the trauma room where I have everything there ready to do immediate um, intubation or tracheostomy. RSV, common cold for you or me, right? But for a young child, suck swallowing and breathing is hard. And then you add mucus onto it and a little fever and these kids choke, become respiratory distress. <laughs> now, it is um, not, um, no, more of a most of a danger for older kids. It's more the younger kids. Any kid who's born with any sort of premature lung disease, cardiac, cystic fibrosis, they already have something on board that you know makes them uh, susceptible. They're already working hard. These children will need to be taking a monthly immunization called Synergist or Pavizumab, you know, biologic, and it's once a month only from winter to spring, and that will prevent them from getting it. So there is a immunization, but this one's monthly. It's not just one. Mononucleosis, the kissing disease. You know, these it's a virus. It's an Epstein-Barr virus. Um, it's, you know, they say kissing disease because it comes from the mouth. It's sharing drinks and straws and, you know, kids mouth-to-mouthing things. Um, You'll have fever, sore throat. What the big deal is, is their glands get swollen and their spleen or liver can get very swollen. It is like a big balloon ready to burst. So biggest thing you need to teach is do not participate in contact sports. This child must keep and protect that abdomen. I told my class about a nine-year-old who had um, mononucleosis, and he, one week after we diagnosed him, went on a uh, three-wheeler out in the Everglades, fell off, he fell on his abdomen, bust his spleen, came to us on rescue, and he, uh, on a helicopter, and the kid was dead on arrival. And so it's very serious. So no sports, no contact sports, okay? And again, it's just Tylenol, Motrin, fluids, rest. All right, let's go into some cardiac stuff. Well, the most common 
cyanotic heart condition is Tetralogy of Fallot. All of a sudden, something happens where that pulmonary artery um, blocks off or a flap of skin goes off, the valve's not right, and all of a sudden, blood can't go into the lungs. And they have what they call tet spells or blue spells. Immediately, take the knees and push them up to the chest. Older children they, that have it that are not repaired will squat like that little boy up there. And they do it because it changes the pressure in the abdominal cavity and the chest, and it forces that pulmonary artery to open. Now, they do have a VSD, that pulmonic stenosis is that pulmon pulmonary valve that's what goes from the right ventricle into the lungs, right? So if it's not going up there, and stenosis is narrowing, an osis, and then the aorta is sort of pulled over a little bit. And because sometimes where blood don't go up, that right ventricle gets stretched. And that's what they call ventricular hypertrophy. These are your congenital heart defects. It's in your book. Just a, a note that increased pulmonary blood flow is there's a hole from the left to the right side. Uh, we know shunting goes from the area of low pressure, uh, high pressure to low pressure. It sort of knows where it has to go. So an ASD, a VSD, it's going to push it back over to the right side. What's in the right side? The pulmonary artery. It's going to have some more blood flow. And that patent ductus arteriosus that's open for fetal circulation. Coarctation is the kink in the aorta, which means blood can't go to the feet. So you have decreased flow going to the feet. And because it has to go somewhere, it's increased um, blood pressures even in the upper extremities. Tetralogy of Fallot, again, it's your cyanotic, but tricuspid atresia. Remember, atresia means nothing, A, without. That tricuspid valve is between the right atrium and right ventricle. There's no opening. So again, this is going to have to depend on other things to keep this child alive with oxygenation. That's that PDA that we're going to have open. <laughs> and transposition is just that switching of um, your vessels, pulmonary and your aorta. They switch and you have to, again, surgery, pull them up, turn around literally and put them back on. Um, and again, that PDA keeps oxygen. Now, what do we see with congenital heart defects? Now, not always at birth do we see them. Um, coarctation is probably one of the ones that you'll see these kids go home and they'll come back three months later and you'll see them, their heart rate's up, their respiratory rate's up and they're swelling and they're tired. One of the things you see is the baby's not eating well. They tire out easily. These children are not meeting their weight requirements, you know, during those first uh, doctor's visits. We go at two weeks after they're born, at two months, four months, six months for immunization, and that weight's not going up. It's something that we're looking at. Well, my baby tires out. I don't know what to do. Well, then you see the heart rate, the rapid breathing, that's something to worry about. And one of the things to look at is the upper extremities and lower extremities are the pulses the same. Um, just by feeling it. I mean, if you have a blood pressure machine, yes, upper and lower. Uh, many a times this is coarctation of the aorta where they get, sewn, uh, get sent home like that. Uh, nobody's fault. It's just sometimes it's not that prominent. So anytime you have a baby, tired, rapid breathing, not eating, not gaining weight, something to look at is congenital. And even if we know it's congenital heart defect, that heart's working so fast. Um, it's burning up calories. These kids are always smaller. The transposition of the great artery, like I said, is the aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched. And we're having pulmonic and systemic blood flow and they're not meet, meeting together. So we need a way to oxygenate. It's just like fetal circulation here. So what we do is we have to keep that fetal circulation or that patent ductus arteriosus open. And mommy during you know pregnancy has something called prostaglandins uh, that are, it's like a hormone that she makes. 
And that keeps that duct open. After birth, mommy's not there. Baby's by himself. So now no prostaglandins are, prostaglandins are being produced. So we need to give them. So we give prostaglandins and what it does, it increases oxygen saturation because now we've connected the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And now we have blood going over to the systemic side from the lungs and it helps that heart to pump more effectively. It's getting oxygen, it feels better. And it also prevents central nervous system involvement because if you know oxygen, you're gonna have problems. Again, what do you see with a PDA? Well, this is a machine-like murmur. You can hear it really loud. The other thing that you see with a PDA is blood pressure. It's going to be different. At birth, an infant's born normal blood pressure, 60 over 40. A child with an open patent ductus arteriosus could be 60 over 18. As we close it, we're gonna see it go back up to where it should. Now, question is then, how do we close it? Well, that's when you give your endomethacin and that stops prostaglandins if there's any left in the body and it will close the duct um, just like that. Rarely uh, do we have to do a surgical, you know, staple closure. As I said, atresia means nothing. You see that picture? That's a tricuspid atresia. There is no opening. So we got to get another way to get oxygen. Stenosis is narrowing. So when you're looking at questions, is it no flow or is it restricted flow? Okay. So think that things. Chest tubes common after surgery. There might be four chest tubes, five chest tubes. It depends on the child, the size, the age, et cetera, et cetera. If the kid is older, the kid's awake when we're pulling those chest tubes out. Usually it's like day three, day four, and we'll be pulling them out uh, when those the drainage decreases. That kid's gonna be scared out of his mind. Like you're gonna do what? Of course, we need to explain it to him. It hurts. <clears throat> now, I've worked with adults also, and I worked night shift, and they used to come around at six in the morning and pull everybody's chest tubes out. So I got really, really um, involved in chest tube withdrawal, and I asked the patient, so how did it feel? Tell me about it, because I just want to know. And they say it burns, it hurts, it's horrible, and then all of a sudden, the pain is gone. So be honest with these children. Make sure you pre-medicate. Teach them what's going to happen. Do not lie. So take vital signs. Take and give your narcotic some good morphine if that's ordered um, for sure, whatever the opioid is. Then tell them what's going to happen. Um, have them sitting up during it and tell them it's going to hurt a little after. But it's not for long and you'll do everything to make it as little pain as possible, okay? And then, you know, always these kids when it's done go, wow, you did a great job. Um, they, they like to hear that. And of course, because you've given a narcotic, the pain is now gone, always reassess with vital signs when you're done. Heart transplants, greatest risk is rejection. It is not infection rejection. So these children will be on immunosuppressive drugs or anti-rejection for a life. Rheumatic fever is caused by a strep infection. Many children come in, they've got the rash, they've got these um, arthralgia, these joints that are swollen, and we look at them and say, oh, have you had a sore throat lately? And if they have, we're going to be uh, saying, Okay, let's treat you. And it's a long course of antibiotics. One of the things that can happen if we go too long and don't get it treated is they're going to have heart valve damage. And it's usually your mitral valve. That can never be corrected. They also can have chorea, which is weird positioning and posturing um, and even walking. Um, that can go away. 
but the only thing we could take care of the rash, the joints and all of that, but heart valves are always going to be damaged. You're going to have to be corrected uh, in another way. Digoxin is a very safe drug to give to children and it's given quite a bit. It increases that contractility. It slows down the heart rate and the heart beats more effectively. We use this a lot in those children like that are apt to heart failure and congestive failure, okay? Same thing that you do for adults. You're gonna do an apical pulse. Usually it's less than 90 or 100, depending on the physician, you're gonna hold it. Now, infants can't tell you um, they're nauseous, but they, you know, or yellow spots, right? In the eyes, like toxicity in the adults. But children, if they vomit, it could be your only sign and maybe a decreased heart rate is what you see. Hold that digoxin, do a dig level um, before, uh, and of course, you're going to call the doctor, hold the dig, call the doctor, and he'll probably be doing a dig level on them. Because um, digoxin, and, and teach those parents at home, if you have a kid vomiting, it could be dig toxicity. You know, in the hospital, you're going to be checking their last level. You're going to be checking their potassium. And of course, doing that apical pulse um, to look at them. Now, cardiac casts are done once we uh, find out that there's some sort of cardiac problem. Post cardiac cath, most common um, side effects is bleeding from the catheterized site, usually right femoral artery, right femoral vein. There's going to be a big uh, pressure dressing there. Number one thing I'm always going to look for when that kid comes back from the cath lab is I want to look at that dressing. Infants, you know, seven pound infant can bleed out very quickly if it starts to squirt blood because those vessels are huge, okay? So check your pulses, document. They might be a little decreased, that's normal. Keep that leg straight. So right leg, keep it straight. Bed rest, 24 hours. Vital signs need to be taken and um, IV fluids, hydration, hydration, always. And always check a blood glucose. You could see stress in blood glucose is elevated or decreased, or they may have been given some uh, fluid, IV fluid with dextrose in it, and it might be high. So these are things that should be watched. Bleeding coagulopathy things, ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. I just love that name. Say it three times fast. Basically, it's a dysfunction of the platelets, or you could call it thrombocytopenia. Many kids come in that they've had um, epistaxis, nosebleeds for no reason, or they get these little bruises. They don't know why. The kid doesn't go out, doesn't play, hasn't fallen down. You know, what is going on? And what we'll do is do a simple CBC. And we will find platelet counts usually less than 20,000. How do we treat it? We're going to give IV Ig or IV immunoglobin and anti-D. And as a nurse, what are we going to do to take care of these children? Well, we're going to do all bleeding precautions. Their platelets are low. They're going to bleed. They're apt to bleed. So, you know, we're going to be avoiding IV sticks, whether they're blood draws, whether they're IVs to be put in, we're going to avoid them as much as possible. We're going to watch for bleeding, the gums, the urine, the stool, look for bruising, right? And if they're in the hospital, we're going to be looking at their CBCs. Are the platelets coming up because we're treating them with IVIG and anti-D? And Sometimes we do give corticosteroids and that also can help. Usually it's after an upper respiratory. Most of the times these are acute and they will go away. Um, rarely will it become chronic. Now, HIV in children. Uh, HIV can be done many way, but let's talk about the HIV mother delivering no, a baby. So you have a... Uh, infant born of a mother um, of HIV. Now, 
hopefully that mother has been on some uh, anti uh, retroviral drugs you know, by about 22 weeks, they can put them on. After birth, we need to immediately get them on an antiviral. And this is to boost and to maximize their immune system, okay? Most common of all opportunist infections is a pneumocystic pneumonia, um, PCP pneumonia. It, there also can be other stuff, but the biggest one is the respiratory uh, pneumocystic pneumonia. The focus, as I said, is improving that infant's immune system, giving those antiretrovirals, always nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Without nutrition, the body can't heal itself. And uh, preventing those opportunistic infections. Good hand washing, right? Um, I've seen children go uh, from an HIV mother be born, and at one year old, they're HIV negative. So that's what we really would like. Types of anemia, iron plastic, megoplastic, hemolytic. Iron and megoplastic are both due to nutrition. You know, children who have iron deficient anemia, remember, they're going to be easily fatigued because there's low blood cell, red blood cells, which carry oxygen. They have no energy for their body. Um, how do we treat it? We're going to be either increasing their diet with iron or we can give iron supplements. And if we need to, we're going to be giving the IM iron dextran to them. Megoplastic is your B12, your intrinsic factor. Replace the intrinsic factor. Hemolytic, they're, um, that is when the blood cells are destroyed and it's usually due to medications. Sickle cell. Sickle cell is their shell, their cells are shaped like sickles and they get stuck. Um, remember with sickle cell, we want to take those vessels and dilate them so we can get the blood through so that we can stop that build up, that, that pain, that swelling and get some blood down um, distally. Cooley's anemia, which is thalassemia and it's the major, the fourth one of all the thalassemias, this is the one that they must live on blood transfusions. The problem with thalassemia um, is that these cells burst. What's inside a red blood cell? It's what we call iron and oxygen. So where does this iron go? It keeps exploding and going into the blood vessels, into the vasculature. These children are going to be needing some sort of iron chelation therapy to get rid of it along with these blood transfusions. And then aplastic anemia, very similar to like a leukemia. It could be white cells, red blood cells, platelets that are all not being made the way that they should. Blood, giving it knowing that uh, a child getting blood is extra fluid. Remember, if we give it too quickly, they could go into circulatory overload, which you'll see all of the jugular veins, et cetera, and the cough because the lungs are filling up. So first thing, we see any sort of reaction, whether it's to the point of this or a rash or just a spike in temp, turn it off, end it, it's done. So again, sickle cell, remember your priority in this is to get IV access, get that vessel open, apply heat helps with vasodilatation too. And again, treating the pain is secondary. It's not first, okay? First priority is going to be rehydrate. And oxygen, we'll put it on, but are there enough red blood cells with oxygen, you know, to be able to carry it around? You know, it's it has some effect, but not a lot. Now, children with cancer. The first thing we're going to do is give them this big period of induction, as we call it. And that's the beginning where our goal is to put this child into remission right there with it. But what happens is neutrophil counts will go down because it doesn't just kill, you know, your cancer cells. So one of the things that we look at is neutrophil counts. And 
if those levels are 500 or less, this is a patient you need to be concerned about. And I'll give you a scenario. You receive report, you've got these four patients and you're looking at all of them and you notice one patient, no matter what their diagnosis is, you see their neutrophils counts down and they've got a fever. That child is at risk to go collapse and go into septic shock. I mean, that's how serious having low neutrophil counts is. So again, making sure we wash hands and then we wash and wear masks, et cetera. Leukemia, again, we're talking about the chemo. As I said, the initial stuff is the induction of the chemo. It's the first part. And the goal of induction is remission. Now, they continue giving the chemo, could be up to a year or more, just in case there's any little piece of anything anywhere hiding, just to get rid of it. Uh, so that first part is when they might get that nausea and the vomiting and feel not well, right? So giving those antiemetics 30 minutes before can help. Osteosarcoma, cancer of a bone, usually femur bone. Uh, a lot of times these are adolescent boys um, and all of a sudden they can't walk or they start limping. So um, they need to get the whole bone gone. They can't just take that piece or that little chip of bone. They got to take the whole femur bone. So there's nothing to connect the knee to the hip. So what they have tried to do is salvage the lower part of your calf and your foot and put that up where the thigh was to have a place to put a prosthesis. So we call that salvaging the limb. And that's the goal. Most of the time they're doing that now, but at times if they can't, then it would be a complete amputation. In leukemia, uh, we've talked about it before, but let's just talk about these types of uh, bone marrow transplants that we can do for them. Now, bone marrow transplants don't have to be your blood type. They can be anybody's blood type. Um, but autologous, uh, I say auto means self or automatically mine, I want it first. So auto means I have blood cells somewhere. This is usually um, in, remember I said leukemia, two to three year old little girls and boys um, can get it. Um, so many parents do have their umbilical cord blood. It's a perfect, perfect thing to use at this point, but it's expensive. So many parents can't afford it. So what they have is allogenic, means allo, allow somebody else or all others can give it to you. We know all others, the best one would be a sibling if possible, but we prefer if possible, we'll get those automatically mine, my stem cells. Brain tumors are uh, most common of all of the solid. Um, what we see in brain tumors is all of a sudden you'll see a parent say, my kid's getting a headache, but it keeps getting worse. So progressive worsening headaches. Then you see them and my kid's vomiting. Um, and it's not after he eats, it's anytime, middle of the night, he wakes up and vomits and it's getting worse. Usually that will say to the doctor, okay, let's do an x-ray, CT, and then they'll find it. Um, they usually will um, do radiation, shrink the tumor, because you have to take part of the brain out, right? Let's shrink it, take out the little bit as possible. Make sure as nurses, those little purple things, those little marks for radiation, never ever wash them off, leave them there um, so that they can get it to that same place. And then remember, post-operatively, make sure that you know how to position and do not fluid overload these children post-op. And then the last thing we have is Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, Hodgkin's is these big non-tender lymph nodes usually from the shoulders up, okay? And because the nodules could be in the neck, they swell 
could hit the larynx, it could create coughing. Part of what they do is uh, they'll see that. And they can do just a little a biopsy and they'll find these Sternberg reed cells and they'll know to do radiation, be able to remove them. Now, the other type of Hodgkin's is non-Hodgkin's, means it's not these large non-tender um, nodes in these areas. It's everywhere in the body. It's diffuse, it's everywhere. So you cannot treat it with just taking out a lymph node. You have to treat it systemically. So non-Hodgkin's is everywhere. Hodgkin's is from the shoulders up. And that's another thing that talks about it there. So know that there's always five doses, uh, calculations. You know, you have all that information. If you need any more on dosage calc, I will help you. Just ask um, uh, if you haven't got it posted in your announcements, let me know and I will send it to you. So that's all I got for today, guys. You all have a good day. Any questions? No, thank you, Professor.